Are we recording? Did it say recording? Oh, okay, good. Okay, hello and welcome. I'm Rosemary Pena, president of the Black German Heritage and Research Association in Africana Studies at Rutgers University, Camden. Our conversation today is the ninth and final event in our fall series themed Art and Resistance, produced in collaboration with Davidson College. My colleague, Dr. Emily Frazier Rath and I are delighted to welcome our special guest, Katharina Warda. But before our discussion begins, I'll ask Emily to please share a little about our work and our class together before introducing and turning the conversation over to our discussant and consultant, Elizabeth Clark Casters and Katerina. Emily? Thank you, Rosemary. My name is Emily Frigerath, and I'm the executive director of the BGHRA and also a visiting assistant professor of German studies at Davidson College. We are honored to host Katarina Vada today, um, along, as always, with our discussant and um, moderator, Elizabeth Clark Casters. Today's conversation is made possible through the generous support of four academic departments at Davidson College, and I'm really excited about this collaboration. Um, as always, I'd like to take a moment to recognize my colleagues who have made this event possible. First, and as always, I would like to thank my colleagues in German studies, including Drs. Burkhart Henke, Maggie McCarthy, and Scott Denham for your continued support and encouragement. I'd also like to thank Dr. Dan Aldridge and the Africana Studies Department, Dr. Melissa Gonzalez and the Gender and Sexuality Studies Department, and Dr. Gail Kaufman and the Sociology Department here uh, for today's um, event and for making it all possible. Finally, I want to offer a special thank you to Amber McIntyre, our department's administrative assistant for making these visits this semester um, possible and for all her work. So thank you all. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our discussant and moderator for today's conversation with Katarina Nevada. I'm excited to introduce Elizabeth Clark Casters as our moderator today. Elizabeth is a member of the BJHRA Executive Board, as Rosemary mentioned, where she serves as our Germany-based consultant for art and culture. You'll recognize her first from our discussion with her in the spring about her own uh, work as a dancer and as an artist, and again in the fall with our students from this semester's um, uh, articulation of Black German Art and Resistance, our co-taught class here at Davidson. Um, she has also served as a discussant and moderate, moderator for several of our public events this year. I'll now turn things over to Elizabeth, who will introduce Katarina, as we mentioned. Uh, thank you all again for being here this afternoon or this evening, whether, wherever you are, and for supporting our efforts this year. So thank you, Rose, Emily, and the BGHRA. Um, actually, I don't really need to introduce myself so much because this event is about Katarina Varda. And I'm very, very happy that she's here and that uh, we get to hear from her and later have some questions. Um, so I think without further ado, I will turn everything over to Katarina. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Thank you for having me. It, I feel so honored to speak to you about my perspective and my topics. And I have prepared quite a long talk um, and I will just read it. And But I'm still looking forward to the discussion afterwards and for all your questions. My talk is called um, Racism Without it vi Its Victims, The Paradox of the Brown East. And what that means will be clear ho hopefully after my talk. I would, I would like to start my presentation with a paradox. I am 37 years old and until a few years ago, I did not exist. By that, I mean as a black woman who comes from the east side of Germany. As a black woman who was born in the GDR, 
um, that is a socialist um, state, um, East Germany, and grew up in East Germany. Of course, I did exist in a physical way, but in the public eye, it was almost unheard of that there are East, German, East Germans who happen to be black or of color. Until a few years ago, I was an invisible person and paradoxically, I lived in the midst of a simul simultaneously hyper-visible racism in East Germany. A hyper-visibility, a hyper-visible racism that happened in a part of Germany that was publicly known to be a homogeneously white space, a space with massive, massive racist violence, but seemingly without victims of racism, without BP, by POCs, and without its own migrant history. I would like to talk about this paradox today. And for that, I have to go a bit deeper into history. So let me explain. In response to World War II, Germany was divided into two independent states from 1949 to 1989. On one, th on one side, there was West Germany, also known as FRG, a capitalist democratic country. And on the other side, East Germany, a self-described socialist state known as GDR. In 1989, this division ended with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the mass demonstration in East Germany known as a peaceful revolution. From then on, the difficult process of reunification and transformation began with it, uh, with the, with it the part of the revolution that was not peaceful at all. As if, um, as if as a symbol in the night of the of October 2 to October 3, 1990, the night before the official reunification, thus the birth of the newly united Germany, the online initiative 2. October 90 counts more than 30 pogroms and violent racist or right-wing outbreaks across, across the country. 20 of them happened in East Germany. Apartments of migrant workers were attacked, explosives were set off, and people were chased through the streets and attacked in public. As if, as a symbol of this night foreshadowed what would become almost commonplace over the next few years, massive public racism and right-wing violence, especially in East Germany. In 1991 and in 1992, these acts of violence are recorded by the police in the thousands each year. But this can only be seen or read as the tip of the iceberg. Among the most prominent of these racist attacks are the pogroms in Hoyerswerda in 1991 and in Rostock Lichtenhagen in 1992, in which a housing estate of Vietnamese families was mobbed, attacked, and finally set on fire by up to 3,000 bystanders and Nazi leaders from the entire country over a period of several days. In other incidents, migrants and BPUC were chased to death, set on fire, and otherwise murdered. Also, every day, insults and attacks were part of the daily life of many BPUCs during this time. Today, therefore, the 1990s and early 2000s are referred to as the baseball bets years, baseball schläger Jahre in German. At that time, the media attention to the phenomenon of racism and white wing violence increased in a very sudden way. In a sudden, in a sudden way, or in no time, as I say, because the phenomenon of racism was considered to be to have been abolished in Germany until then. The GDR described itself as an anti-racist state in which racism has been deprived of its ideological foundation and therefore could not exist. West Germany re re relegated racism to the past before the Second World War. So here, too, racism was officially considered abolished in a way. But with the unification, it changed back virtually overnight in the newly reunifi reunified Germany. Years followed, not only of white wing violence, but also of its hyper visibility, at least whenever it came to East Germany, effectively, effectively to lose the loser of the Cold War and the often self-described loser of the reunification. East Germany is space 
that at the same time is always described in the media as regressive, poorer, dumper, and above all, a homo homogeneously white. Descriptions of the typical East German until today are reminiscent of, the, of descriptions of the typical Trump voter or of, um, and excuse my classist expression here, of white trash. People who are virtually pre predestined for racist violence. The, the paradox, however, is that with these descriptions, East Germany is, is so whitewashed until today, while West Germany is described as cosmopolitan middle class with a migrant influence and diverse. So diversity and the absent the absence of racism on the one side, on the West German side, and racist violence in a homogenous um, white culture on the other side, East German, on the East German side. An idea that has manifested in self, itself in the word of the brown East. Brown as a symbol color of German fascism marks East Germany as its direct successor. The image goes hand in hand with the media representation of East Germans over the past 32 years. The, the East German, in quotation marks, is mostly male, speaks a provincial dialect, has an uncivil demeanor, and is above all, like I said before, white. Thus, in the media representation, East Germany as a homogeneously white space is full of predators and free of migration and non-white Germans. That is, thus, it is also free of victims of, of racist violence, which paradoxically should prevent um, its occurrence in the first place. So racism could actually not exist in the way um, East Germans are described in media image. But how does it go together? I myself was born a black woman in the GDR and grew up in East Germany. I witnessed and survived the violence of the 90s, the baseball bat years. I know exactly what, it, what this hypervisibility of white wing violence in East Germany is about. Even more, all my life I have wished to make racism as a problem even more visible. And at the same time, I think this hypervisibility of racism in East Germany is a problem that stands in the way of anti-racist practices. Which is um, which this little anecdote um, maybe confirms. Um, a few weeks ago, I was invited to read one of my essays in Hannover, a West German town. I read from my essay, Der Ort, aus dem ich komme, heißt Dunkeldeutschland. The place I come from is called Dark Germany, which doesn't make sense in English, but maybe um, it will be more clear um, later on. The place where I come from is called Dark Germany, published in 2020, a very personal essay about my experiences as a black girl and young woman growing up in my hometown, Wenigerode in East Germany, after the reunification. In this essay, I mainly describe the violence of the 90s and the early 2000s. One episode in this essay sounds like that, for example. And now it's a direct quote for my, for my essay. It is 1992, I'm seven years old, and I attend the second grade of a concrete block elementary school. On my way home, my real lessons start, running away, hiding, showing no fear. I begin to learn to run when the girls group from the vocational school starts throwing stones at me, calling me the N-word. I learn to hide in time when groups of men in bomber jackets approach me and to slowly become numb because there is no way out of this hell called home. After my reading, there was a discussion with the audience in which mainly um, East socialized listeners shared their experiences. We talked about pogroms like in Hoyerswerda and Lichtenhagen. We talked about neo-Nazis, about everyday attacks and everyday racism. But I remember one comment particularly well from a black woman who grew up in a village near Hannover, so in West Germany. She said, when in the 90s, great racist violence in East Germany was all over the newspapers and words like the, the Brown East appeared, I honestly felt envious. 
envious, not because of the of the violence, of course, but about the fact that there was so much talk about racist violence. And she continued, I have experienced so much violence myself in my hometown, so much racism in West Germany, but it was never talked about like it would not exist. This very honest remark has stuck with me. In the context of my work and my personal preoccupations with this subject, I am well aware of the, of the effect of the high level of right-wing violence in West Germany before and after reunification. But far too seldom do we hear what the invisibility of racism and the pure concentration on East German violence meant and means for people who are affected by racism in West Germany. Vice versa, to the fact that racism exists also uh, only uh, to the vice versa to the fact that racism exists only in East Germany. Um, until today, we hardly ever talk about the fact that victims of racism also exist in East Germany. And it is not only a white or a perpetrator state. And we also almost never talk about how East Germans of color or people who are affected by racism in East Germany actually deal with the situation. But coming back to the black woman and her comment, the moment she said it, I could completely understand and re recipro reciprocate her feeling of envy. I had felt something very similar when in 2015, with new movements like Pegida and attacks on a refugee, ho refugee homes like in Heidenau, a new wave of white wing violence became again hyper visible in East Germany. At the very beginning of this report, I hoped that this time the hyper visibility of racism would finally lead to an anti-racist mind mindset in politics, media and, so and society. I was wrong again. In the same way as I knew it from the hyper -vis visibility before, racist violence in East Germany was made visible mostly by white West German media, but in order, but not in order to reflect and solve the problem. Rather, racism and white wing violence were once again shifted to East Germany as a phenomenon in order to displace it um, in the self-German self-image and not to have and not to have take not to have to take it seriously. For me, a new wave of a well-known feeling followed silence and delegating political responsibility. I always, I always felt that this silence was a form of violence in itself and finds a manifestation in the idea of the so-called Brown East, because the idea makes it almost impossible to really discuss racism as, a, as an everyday problem that concerns East and West Germany. But let's start at the beginning and let me give you a short introduction into to a most time overlapped chapter of history, the history of migration and racism in East Germany, so the socialist East Germany, the GDR. Migration and racism in the GDR. As a legacy of German fascism with the founding of the GDR, um, the state population was artificially homogenous white a condition that we in Germany often regard as a starting point or even the normal state of society. Like Germany has always been white and diversification started not before the 1950s, which is clearly wrong. I would argue that this most common idea is racist itself. Instead, the white was German culture after World War II was in fact rather a consequence of the Holocaust and an artificial in introduced condition. With the end of the National Socialism in World War II, migration gradually leveled off again in East and West Germany alike. Unlike in the West, in West Germany, migration to the GDR took place almost exclusively through state agreements and treaties. It almost never happened privately or individually. 
therefore the various paths of uh, migrants to the GDR can be divided into rough patterns, waves and groups. The largest group with about half of the migrants in the GDR consisted of so-called contract workers. These were temporary workers who came to the GDR in the 1960s, primarily from Poland and Hungary. In the 1970s, contract, contract workers came mainly from Cuba and Algeria, and in the 1980s from Mozambique, Angola and Vietnam. But contract workers also came from China, Mongolia, Ethiopia, Czechoslovakia, Slovakia, Yemen, and many other countries. A second large group is represented by international students from most diverse countries in the world. Um, even US students came to the GDR. And the third main group of migrants were so-called political immigrants, highly respected political refugees, especially from Pinochet ruled Chile and apartheid ridden South Africa. But also artists and intellectuals from other countries moved to the GDR or stayed for a while, such as black musician Paul Robeson and his wife Eslanda Robeson, or the Serbian actor Gojko Mitic, who became a superstar in the GDR. The treatment of migrants in the GDR is ambivalent and cannot be, cannot be pigeonholed. Nevertheless, it is characterized by a particular contrast. On the one hand, the GDR regarded itself as, as an anti-fascist and anti-colonial state in which the ideological foundation for racism had been removed due to the shift from capitalism to socialism. In other words, words racism was considered to have been officially abolished, a maxim that was tried to be implemented in many areas. For example, the GDR put a lot of emphasis on anti-fascist education. Visits to concentration camps and confrontation with the German colonial past were part of the standard school education even more than today. On the political level, the GDR very visibly supported anti-colonial struggles, for example, in Mozambique, and maintained relations with anti-racist activists. The latter was evident, for example, in the One Million Roses for Angela Davis campaign, a state-initiated campaign in which students, employees, and private individuals in the GDR sent postcards and letters for the liberation of Black American civil rights activist Angela Davis, a campaign that Angela Davis re, um, recipro <laughs> reciprocated uh, with numerous official visits to the GDR after her acquittal, and a campaign that to this day sends many GDR citizens into rapturous memories. On the other hand, as in probably every country, there was also simply racism. Which cannot be detected, which can be detected in, on various levels. The first level would be the institutional level, which is also the most prominent level. Racism can already be identified at the institutional level, in other words, on the part of the anti racist state itself, the GDR. This is clearly visible in the spatial and social isolation in which many migrants, especially contract workers, were subjected. So, thus, uh, migrant workers were ghettoized and in some cases kept away from the white German population. Mostly they lived in dormitories out uh, on the outskirts of the cities, which allowed a little, as little contact as possible with the rest of the population. Paulino Miguel, who himself originally came to the GDR as a contract worker, describes this in his research as a double wall. Wall, On the one hand, the wall as a border between the two German states, GDR and FRG, so East Germany, West Germany. On the other hand, um, an invisible border within the GDR population between the white population and the migrant or BIPOC population. This invisible wall, wall continues to provide institutional inequalities of treatment for migrant workers in terms of unequal wages payment in comparison to the white German population. Racialized migrant workers from Vietnam, Angola and Mozambique in particular uh, received only a fraction of the wages of East German citizens. In addition, they have, they have to 
they had to pay pensions and social benefits to the GDR, which they almost never uh, got back because of their mostly temporary stay. Contract workers from Mozambique are also deprived of part of their wages, which are to be paid to them only after their return to Mozambique. However, this never happened. To this day, every Monday, hundreds of people demonstrate in Maputo, the capital of Mozambique. They demand their payment um, of withhold wages from Mozambique and Germany, as well as simply recognition for their achievements and the injustice they experienced. Institutional racism on the part of the GDR, however, is also reflected in active efforts to prevent racialized migrant workers from settling in, in the GDR. For example, pregnant migrant workers from Vietnam were given the choice of either having an abortion or being expelled immediately. The second level, which feels quite unique to the GDR context, is the level of the functionaries. If one, look at, if one looks at the power relations within the population, one notices above all state functionaries as an above all state functionaries as an essential interface between the state and the population. This includes, for example, supervisors of migrants in, in companies or student dormitories who were there to enforce the rules, check personal details, and ensure peace and order. Here, at the interface between state power and individual execution, the functionaries had a lot of leeway of their own. Write, for example, Ilanga Mugulu in her master thesis, quoting the migrant worker Kahti Hao, who reported in 1919, quote, um, that in many workplaces, the German supervisors played the role of the autocrats and that their behavior was often characterized by arrogant, militant, Stalinist, and nationalist traits. The third level is um, the level of the population. And I think most of the time we leave out this, this level or we don't think about this level of the population when it comes to East Germany because it's a socialist state and we think mostly about the state itself and the power of the state, but the people were had an agency of course so um and of course um it is a level of racism as well unfortunately uh, another level of racism is the often the often um forgotten that is often forgotten as everyday racism and racist violence within the gdr population even through racism even though racism was considered to be abolished in the gdr Neither German fascism nor the colonial past was really dealt with. Thus, until the end of the GDR, enormous racist resentments and prejudices continued to circulate. For example, black people and by POCs were considered to be lazy. It was also said that they could not be trusted. True, um, true to colonial ideas, black men and contract workers from Algeria, for example, were described as violent and oversexed. For example, um, perpetrators and witnesses um, tried to justify the first racist pogrom of the GDR by saying that they only wanted to drive away, and I quote here, knife men and rapists out of the city. In fact, just normal Algerian contract workers were chased through the streets of downtown Erfurt for several days in 1975. But there were also there was also there were also everyday insults and exclusions. Some days some days ago, on a podium, for example, um, the East a podium I attended, um, for example, the East German author Manja Prekels recalled that in her hometown or home village, it became kind a kind of sport to chase migrants and racialized people from public spaces in the GDR, and also to throw them into the village river, a practice that is perpetuated to, until today in tests of courage um, by children who play war games with firecrackers at night in the front of the refugee home 
in order to scare away refugees. Physical attacks can also be found in the GDR. In 2014, the historian Harry Weibel published um, in German, it's Der gescheiterte Antifaschismus der SED. It's um, the failed anti-fascism of the SED party, racism in the GDR. In it, um, he counts over 8,600 racist, neo-Nazis and anti-Semitic acts of propaganda and violence recorded in the German in the GDR based on entries and archive files of the Ministry of Security, um, also called Stasi. One can only speculate about the unrecorded number of unreported cases. Hardly any of these attacks ever became public. Rather, the state remained silent. And that's another level of um, racism um, in the GDR. Um, the invisible—it's not—it's not a level um, like before, but it's—it's it's rather, it's—it's it's rather a, um, a side of of racism, the invisibility of racism, which can be seen as a form of violence, racist violence itself. The legal and social consequences of the perpetrators um, of such acts were hardly given. Racist attacks and hostilities were rarely, if ever, punished. Rather, the GDR defended its, its self-image as a formerly anti-racist state in which there could logically no, be no racism. Mm -hmm. Counter evidences were therefore not accepted. Crimes were not uh, prosecuted and were swept under the rug. Racist discrimination could not be reported under the designation again because officially it did not exist. Weibel sees various reasons for this approach. On the one hand, the government did not want to antagonize the population by, by consistently prosecuting racism. Apparently, support for the state was perceived as too fragile for that. The historian also sees a significant additional reason for the anti-racist image cultivating in the cultivation of relations between other countries. According to Weibel, especially the countries that send contract workers, um, contract workers, a frightening example of this is the murder of two Cuban contract workers, Raúl García Paré and Dan, uh, Delphine Guerra. In 1979, during a racist hunt by a mob of um, GDR citizens, the two men aged 21 and 18 did, died in Merseburg. According to Weibel, prosecution in the GDR was stopped with a reference to good relations with Cuba. The concealment of racist violence was also practiced in the case of, of minor incidents. In general, research shows that racism was not recognized as such, but was minim minimized. An important motive for this was, um, an important motive which came with this was to assign blame to those affected. In other words, to commit a, a perpetrator victim reversal. The migration expert Christiane Mende writes in the context after writes this in context after interviews with former contract workers, um, and she um, looks at racist incidents and how they were evaluated in the company. And um, the quote goes like this: um, "The migrant workers and the migrant workers and is and it is previous uh, previously in this." Um, Sorry, the migrant workers were not heard or taken seriously. Their motives and views are, if at all, only distort, distorted and are at the same time regarded as proof that the behavior of the company or the social conditions in the GDR, um, but that not the behavior of the company or the social conditions in the GDR, but the flawed personality of the rep of the migrant worker was a cause of the problem. So not the, not the state was blamed or the company or the behavior of um, the, a racist um, company member, but the person itself and its flawed character was um, 
was blamed for anything that happened. Migration experts such as me, Christiane Mende, um, Patrice Potros and Damian Macon Ulad also point out that victims and victims of racism was uh, who reported racist behavior faced sanctions up to um, up to and including expulsion. What these accounts um, have in common is the racist and violent dimension of invisibility. Racism becomes invisible. It does not officially exist, but it is there. Uh, but it is there nonetheless, and even more due to the lack of sanctions and education, it can unfold unhindered. That it make, thus it makes people disappear in the worst cases physically, and in the example of Delphine Guerra and pa uh, Raúl García Paré, and in other cases through through expulsions and departures from the from the GDR, in most cases, probably through silence, by forcing migrants and by POC to risk draw into themselves, by making themselves small and less vulnerable, by making themselves invisible. I just have a look at the, at the time and I see, wow, um, time is running. So I will just skip a little bit from my talk and we'll go further to the end. Um, so let's talk a bit more about invisibility of and racism. Well, no, um, I skipped this as well. I wanted to talk about a little bit about invisibility of racism in um, West Germany before reunification, because I talked a lot about the GDR now. Um, but let me just um, summarize it. Um, the, the West German state was not officially um, an anti-racist um, or anti fascist state, they did not officially abolish um, um, racism, but somehow there was a mindset that delegated racism to the past, to the past before the Second World War. And now there was a point zero and we start fresh and um, racism somehow is a phenomena of the past and we are in the present and it's gone as well. So if we look into racist violence um, that appeared as well in uh, West Germany, especially in the 80s, um, every time, or not every time, but m many times um, when the media reported about actual racist violence, it was um, described highly um, apolitical. It was used violence or justified or something like this, but it never, um, Racism never made its way to um, to the public eye because um, it was described highly unpolitical. So let's switch then to the years after the reunification. Um, we we have stated now on both sides, racism was kind of abolished because officially it did not exist. With the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the GDR system collapsed, and with it, with it's a fixed structure of the of the, of the SED state. Um, for a time, a new system was not yet in place, and even after German reunification in 1990, it still had to be tested and established. Established. In the meantime, the 1990s chaos and anarchy reigned in East Germany, and it was um, as it was called from now on. And I quote um, the rapper Hendrik Bors, and I will just summarize it as well, because he said, um, romantics often um, glorify anarchy, but what he has um, experienced after the reunification of Germany was pure anarchy, anarchy and chaos, and it was not, um, not romantic or nice in any ways, because it was, um, it was the law of the strongest and um it was like a neo-nazi um hegemony on the streets and they decided how you move on the streets and what uh safe spaces or not so the the public space was highly um it was just dangerous because um there was there was no laws in place which prevent prevented um, violence um, and like I said before as if as a symbol more than 30 programs 
pogrom-like right-wing violent acts happened in the night of the reunification, 20 of them in the ter territory of the former GDR. In the same year, um, in the same year, Amadio Antonio died. Um, he was um, he was described as the first racist victim after the reunification, and a lot of other um, acts of violence became very um, visible, like the programs in Hoyerswerda and Rostock Lichtenhagen. And for the first time, news about racism dominated the headlines of the newspaper. Papers. The rights of the Lichtenhagen are broadcasted daily and live on the spot of the TV news formats. One act of violence exaggerated the next one in the um, media representation. And the um, culprits, uh, culprits were also quickly identified. And here I speak, I want to speak again of the paradox of the um, Brown East and why it's in my opinion a problem. So after I said, um, so after so after all I said, the image of the brown east should be true after all, right? Um, but the answer is not that clear. To come back to the paradox of the brown east, it is worth taking talking about a second dimension of the paradox. The term brown east correctly and necessarily calls out um, racist violence in East Germany but it also delegates it to a certain, to a specific place, to a foreign place, I would even argue. With terms like the Brown East, a specific group of clear perpetrators was identified, the East Germans. With the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Second World War, the political West clearly emerged as a victor of the Cold War. The process of reunification also followed this logic namely not as an equal unification, rather numerous, numerous um, processes such as, um, uh, such as the rights um, already fought for women um, worked to the disadvantage of the East Germans. In addition, a whole wave of devaluation arose in the media and in society as pressed in East German jokes or jo jokes about East Germans, experiences of of inferior esteem, and to this day, East Germans structurally earn less, are less represented in positions of leadership and power, have less pro property and heritage, and are hardly part of German elites. Aspects that manifest themselves in the widespread feeling about many East Germans of being second-class citizens. In my use, East Germans often appeared on TV as dim-witted fringes and joke characters, um, like in movies like Go Trabi Go and characters like Sachsen Paul in Mallorca Mike and Cindy Ausmatzan. Um, and those characters were shaped by the image, they shaped the image of the East Germans in the 1990s and early 2000s. By contrast, East German perspectives, whether on their own transformation experiences in the course of the unification or on other topics are widely absent from the public discourses. In general, there's a lack of talk about East Germany, especially from East German perspectives. For years, when East German state when East Germany was discussed, it was mostly from a West German perspective and in connection with um, racist um, violence. On the other hand, on the one hand, this attribution is an expression of the actual condition in uh, many Eastern German regions. On the other hand, it is also a narrative, at a narrative attribution that interesting enough, hardly leads to racism being taken seriously and combated in a targeted manner. Uh, on, the on the contrary, it leads to a situation in which um, racism in Germany is perceived primarily and exclusively as, a East, as an East German problem, which has little to do with the rest of the, of the Republic, but at best is um, is uh, is still um, a direct result from the GDR, thus um, has nothing to do with the overall German history and don't have to be taken seriously. Um, common terms like the Brown East 
speaks a clear language in this regard. The problem is not only that East Germany is, um, is um, shortened to a homogeneous space. The main problem is that the so-called Brown East in Germany becomes an instrument for not really having to deal with racism and white wing violence in Germany for far too long. I often talk about how there is a mindset in Germany that says, we Germans, we in Germany, we don't have a problem with racism, but we do have racists, but that are only Aussies, so people from the East. Racism, that racism is only a problem from the others. And in this case, it's an East German problem, not a West German problem or an overall German problem. It is a problem from um, people who are considered um, to be mainly white, not middle class, and, um, and digressed how I told before. Mm. And I try to shorten it again to come to an end. Um, in the same way, I will, I would just, um, I would just say, well, no, I will, I will read the rest of my talk. Um, so the one problem with the, with the word brown ease and the idea that racism is so hyper visible in East Germany is that it's so uh, delegated to this, only to this East German state and like it doesn't exist in West Germany. And it is not reflect, it is not delegated to East Germany because it is there, but to, to um, not have to deal with it. And that is a problem. And, um, and it's not, and also it is not a solution for racism. Narratives of the Brown East um, obscure on the one hand, the diversity and the history and experiences of migrants and East German of color, in a, that is another problem. I often describe this as a double invisibility, invisible through the lack of representation of East German perspectives, invisible through the lack of representation of non-white German perspectives, together double invisible or, or just non-existent, like I felt for so many years. But the biggest problem with the Brown East paradox is that it makes racism untouchable. Racism and white wing violence become something foreign that happens to and by them, but not to us or by us. Thus, the white German, a mostly Western society, makes it really easy for itself. But, um, but as my anecdote in the beginning um, hopefully showed, in the end, the victims of racism and right-wing violence in East and West Germany are the ones who suffer and have to solve the problem in the end. So thank you for your um, thank you for your attention. I had to shorten it in the end. I'm really sorry that I prepared my talk for far too long. Um, <laughs> and sorry, I'm a bit nervous because I hardly ever speak in English, but thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Katarina. Uh, actually, I think we could have listened to you for another another hour at least. It's so <laughs> interesting what you were talking about and uh, so informative. Um, I have two questions for you right away. Um, it's about the emphasis of the differences between East and West Germany. Uh, on the one hand, the, the political systems, but also from the West German media and academia, the differences between the character of East and West Germans are emphasized. But when you talk about this invisibility, to oh, I'm oh, yeah, sorry, the, I would. The, sorry, my my internet was gone. I could. Could you repeat your question? Sorry, I. Yeah, the my internet is also not stable. So, um, the different the experiences of the IPOC in both East and West Germany 
are very similar. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to know when you began to really open up as um, someone who is doing anti-racist work as specifically an East German. How mm -hmm. was your reception from BIPOC activists, anti-racist workers from West Germany? Oh, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Actually, um, for me, it was quite a different process. I considered myself as to be in East German all my life. And it was such an important part for me because not because it's so great, but it's because because I grew up um, in East Germany, I had the experience, I, I made the experience I, I made. Um, I, I think if I would have grown up in West Germany, some of the experiences would be the same, but some probably totally different. So um, for me, the process of reunification, the violence during the 90s and early 2000s, it was such a dominant part of my um, growing up. Um, so it was always clear to me that I am East German and I speak from an East German perspective. Um, it was quite a long way for me to find out or to identify with being Black because it was being black was so invisible in East Germany. There was not no such thing as being black because in the media representation and also in the self image of East Germans, um, the, I always saw, thought black people, yes, they, they live in the US and maybe they are black people in West Germany, but it was such a hard way for me to to identify with being black, not because I didn't want to, but um, because it was just, um, it, it didn't came to me. Um, so identifying as an East German black woman um, happened, I don't know, some, some years ago, maybe. But um, before, before that, um, I still did all my, I think all my life I did anti-racist work and I was, um, and I even in my in my research, I um, I targeted um, um, anti-racism as a as a subject um, of interest. But um, but when it comes to um, to anti-racist uh, activists, to black activists, to activists of color, I think it is. Um, when I came to groups of black um, activists my East German heritage, my East German experiences and perspectives were quite um, not taken seriously, I think. And not because, um, I think, um, not because, um, it, it, actually, no, I don't know why, but um, I think it's, it's um, that's why I talk about this, um, sorry, I have to, I have to um, pull myself together, but um, I, I have to structure my, my thoughts. Um, I think I talk about I talk a lot about this double invisibility because um, not only a black perspective is quite invisible in um, German society, but also an East German perspective. And when it comes to being a black East German woman, um, it's it's like an intersection of um, of um, perception. And if I talk to um, if I talk in an East German context, my I always exp uh, very often experience that my Black perspective is not taken seriously. And in, in the same way, when I come to Black activist groups, um, I feel very often that my East German perspective is not taken seriously. So it somehow works in a similar way. I don't want to say in the same way, but in a similar way. And um, yeah, let me hold it like this. Yeah, thank you. I have a question from one of the students. Um, how did your experience in German education impact your scholarly perspective when you studied German history? Also, in what ways does othering or invisibility manifest in education in East Germany? Hmm. 
interesting. There is so many questions in one question. Um, on the one hand, I think um, the invisibility of um, of non-white um, German perspectives, which I see um, in in the public sphere, um, is not in the same way represented uh, when it comes to um, to research and um, and scientific work. There is actually a quite um, a, an old tradition of. Um, Looking into a migration history, um, a GDR migration history, and um, looking into a non-white perspective when it comes to the East, but somehow this research never made it to the public eye. Um, it, it, there's like a division between there is already research done, but it um, in the public in the public eye it just just uh, is not um, represented. Um, and there was a second part of the question. Can I hear that again or can I read it somewhere? Yeah, I will ask it again. Um, how does your, oh, I, the question seems to be there. In what ways does othering or invisibility So I was I was off for a moment. Yeah. So um, I will repeat. <clears throat> How does your experience in German education impact your scholarly perspective when you study German history? And what way does othering or invisibility manifest in education in East Germany? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, I, I try to find out what is meant with education, like um, like education in schools or education at universities. I think um, more in, in the university level. I, I, I think. Um, well, I think, like I said before, um, well, on the one hand, there was already um, work done when it comes to, there's a lot of work done um, on a um, university level when it comes to East German studies. But othering um, is still a factor because um, a friend of mine, she is a scholar in East German studies and she studies a migration history. Um, and she was told, um, if you do your PhD in this field, you probably won't have a, um, a, a university career because it's such a minor, it's considered to be such a minor subject. There's no a lot, not a lot of funding for it. Um, only people who don't want to have a career in academia, they go this path. So this is a sign of, sign of othering, um, not really about, inv about um, invisibility, but it, the subject itself is othered um, in, and um, yeah, it's othered to be like, it's not the real history of Germany. It's their history. It's a minor subject. It's not, it's not worth funding. It's not worth to build a career on that. And you probably won't have a career on that. So um, yeah, it is a, fa a factor which works vice versa, actually. It's an interesting question. And also, um, Sometimes I talk to scholars from abroad who study um, in East German studies, um, and they told me the same thing. They were so frustrated because they were not taken seriously because they don't look at the real Germany, but at the GDR and East Germany. And it's like, um, well, why do, do you do that? It's not, it's not real history. It's not real Germany. It's just like a gimmick um, subject. So yes, othering work there, unfortunately. But I think also it's changing. Um, during the last probably three years since nine since two thousand nineteen, there's quite a shift in German society when it comes to speaking about East Germany, because so many voices, East German voices in the public sphere, were louder and. A lot of books and texts were published, and um, there's quite a discussion going on now about the invisibility of East German perspective and also 
um, the invisibility of a diverse um, a diverse East German perspective. Um, but I think still there's a long way to go. Yes. Okay, there's a question um, from Emily Fraser app, and she would like to know your thoughts about the Razzia yesterday. Ah, interesting that she knows yeah. that. Yeah, and yeah, it was even reported in the New York Times. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Wow, okay. <laughs> your thoughts about the media coverage of this and the NSU murders. Oh, wow. Okay. Two big topics. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, the Razzia, I think, I think actually it's, for me, it's most interesting to hear now that was even reported in the New York Times. Um, I think the Razzia yesterday and the way it was reported um, shows also a shift when it comes to um, looking in, at um, neo-Nazis and um, white wing violence, because it was a Reichsburger um, Razzia. They only looked into, um, into households of people who were considered to be Reichsburger. And Reichsburger is um, a phenomena, a new Nazi, neo-Nazi phenomena. Um, and for quite a long time, um, racism in Germany was delegated only to white wing violence. So we didn't spoke about, we, we did not speak about racism. It was like, yeah, we have racists and we know how they look like. And then neo-Nazis were described and neo-Nazis in a very typical way, like, young guys um with bold uh a bold young guys with baseball bats and um and bomber jackets and um like pictures from the 90s but um and, and still um i think half a year ago there was a text in uh, there was an article in spiegel um quite a big german newspaper and it was about neo-nazi violence and the pictures were directly from the 90s. Mm -hmm. And um, and at the same time, we have a huge problem with um, newer, they are not that new, but newer Nazi phenomena like Reichsburger. And for quite a long time, Reichsburger were considered to be like, yeah, they're a bit weird, they're a bit strange, but they're not a problem. And they were not considered as full on neo-Nazis and racists mm -hmm. and i think the razzia and the way it was reported in the news um shows a little shift to recognizing hey that is a problem we have a problem with right-wing violence and they don't look like um the guys in the 90s any longer they look like iceberger and it's mm -hmm. in the middle of our society not somewhere else outside there it's it's the middle class which is so problematic as well and I think that, so I I was um I was very happy to read about the Razzia yesterday. NSU, whew, the opposite phenomenon. <laughs> um, NSU, um, the NSU murders um, were marked by invisibility and silence. Um, for such a long time, um, the murders happened. They were the police didn't recognize a pattern, even though people were demonstrating on the streets in Kassel and saying, we don't want to have another victim. We see the connections between the murders and the police was not, no, no, no connection. That was one thing. And the other thing was um, the victims were blamed um, as perpetrators of the act. So it was um, the victims even call it like a terror after the terror. Um, after after the murders, after the um, bomb attacks, the police was so brutally racist against the actual victims and um, the survivors. And they blamed the families. They uh, made up stories like it was... It was probably a drug thing. It was a, it was an immigrant thing, um, but not it was a racist thing or it was a neo-Nazi thing. And also then the NSU um, trials were so highly racist and the media coverage was so highly racist. And I think actually the NSU murders and the NSU trials and um, 
the um, the criticism uh, about how it was presented and how racist everything about it was um, also changed um, changed a little bit um, in Germany when it comes to media coverage. Um, I see a huge shift um, from NSU to Hanau, for example, but it was not, we always say like, yeah, it was a different time. No, it was not a different time. It was due to the activism of the people who really changed something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Emily, would you like to elaborate on your question? Uh, and, and not really. I mean, I think that it's really interesting to think about the media representations of um, of the raid and also of the NSU murders together and this whole thing, um, because that really drives the discourse. But yeah, I mean, we heard it yesterday. My mother actually called me in the morning in the morning um, and asked me. Emily, what's a Reichsburger? And I was like, Mom, that is like Nazi language. What are you talking about? And then she told me so um, that that she had heard about it. So um, that's how we heard about it on sort of like our public radio, that sort of thing. Um, interesting. Yeah, thanks for your response. Uh, but I want to leave room for other people's questions too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um... I will just say one short thing in elaboration on that whole complex of this raid. You, Katarina, were talking about um, the institutional side of racism, which is totally ignored and relegated to um, a, a, a private thing, you know, like they are racist, but there is no institutionalized racism. And when I see who was caught up in this raid, that they were members of the police, they were people working with uh, in certain official capacities within uh, local and state governments. I think, Military. yeah, I think the, seriousness becomes much more evident um, when you see not just the middle of society, but people in positions of power. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of scary. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And, and that is such a good point. Yeah, especially yesterday with Razia, you could see that also with other uh, phenomena, like there was a case like the Hannibal Collective. I don't know if someone heard about it. It was um, a group of prepper and um, with highly racist mindset. And it was not the, the shock factor was not about how many people that were, but in what positions all of them were. And um, there's also, especially, I think, also especially politi politicians and also the military, again and again and again, um, come um, uh, is is um, um, is a, is a huge part of um, of the new neo Nazi movement. But um, it's such it's so invisible to us, and is uh, the representation is um, or the media coverage is barely there about that which is scary and quite unfortunate. There was a member from the KSK yesterday um, who um, was, um, uh, was um, who, no, how do you say it? Um, he, the, the Russia was at his place and the KSK is a special unit as a military. They are, um, they are, they, they, are um, they have to protect us if something happens. And um, the car's car always comes in the news when it comes to super, uh, to, to, to right-wing terror even, which is super scary. So um, yeah, there's a long way to go in Germany. Yes. <laughs> Yesterday I was on a podium and we talked about Mölln, Mölln um, in 1992. 
um the bre the the um how do you say it's a fire attack now <laughs> sorry my English is so bad I just noticed um so um a house was set on fire and um members of two families died because of that um it was a racist attack in 1992 in Mölln and we I moderated a podium um an official podium and I talked to one of the politicians before and I I asked her, can I ask you about institutionalized racism in politics? And she was like, there's no such thing as institutionalized racism. I was like, oh, wow. OK, we are here 30 years after after a racist attack um, that killed so many people. And um, it was so invisible and the uh, memory about it was not really there in German society and what so what were we talking about then if we don't talk about institutionalized racism yeah yeah here's another question from uh, a student from Sonia do you think the lack of interest in the East German VIPOC history and perspectives has to do with the fact that this is connected to socialism, which is not regarded as an equal form of society. Yeah, I think so. I think it's part of it. I think here, um, a lack of interest because of socialism um, overlaps with a lack of interest of um, Black history which is also still there. I think actually most time people don't even know or they don't consider that there is such thing as a Black East German or Black East German history. Mm -hmm. um, very often I talk to also to other people of color or Black people and I tell them, yeah, I, I was born in the GDR and grew up in East Germany and it's like, like an arrow sign in front of them. It's like, there are two things and we can't bring them together. Black Germans only exist in West Germany and there was East Germany. How can this? Um, yeah, there is, there, it, of course, I mean, it's it's also um, just a effect of, um, of, a dis, of the disinterest. But also very often people are really surprised and honestly surprised that there is such thing as Black East Germans. But yes, um, I do think... Um, it, socialism and um, especially after the reunification, I mean, um, and after the, the Cold War, um, social, the socialist state, the so-called socialist state, were like the um, loser of the of the Cold War. So the interest level was very um, focused on the winner of the Cold War. So yeah, yeah, I think so. And also it was, it is, very often it's it's very um, presented like, oh, it's problematic because it's socialism. We shouldn't talk about it in a good way because it's socialism. Why should we say anything good about it? Um, and I think that is also a problem. And it has to be possible to talk um, to talk about the various sides of um, the GDI and other um, so-called so socialist states. The good, the bad, the ugly, but not to to put it in a um, box and say no, it's it's not interesting and it's problematic in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my second question for you is, <clears throat> what do you think the next steps for the future need to be? Like, what is your vision for POC for the future? <laughs> wow. For POCs in the future, um, wow. Um, what I wish for would be um, stronger alliances, um, also stronger alliances um, and more intersectional alliances. Um, that would, would be my wish for the POCs in um, Germany. I think it's so interesting to learn from West German Black activists because they have such a long tradition, uh, or a longer tradition um, of um, anti-racist, or not anti-racist activism, but Black activism, and um, they have a lot of knowledge. They have they have more language than we have in East Germany, actually, because it was invisible and we, we were not even able to talk about it. Um, 
So, um, but also at the same time, in East Germany, um, growing up in East Germany, growing up in the 90s in East Germany, in the early 2000s in East Germany, um, the growing, being born in the GDR, there's also a certain kind of knowledge which we could bring in and to, um, to bring this together and um, and figuring out how to combine it to make um, a, like a like a black alliances or a, um, an alliance of color stronger and give it a um, better foundation. That would be that would be uh, something I really wish for. Yeah. And also at the same time, but this is um, if we talk about anti racism in Germany or even in academia um, today, um, it is highly influenced by Western ideas, which is not bad. Um, I was very happy to find a, such a great knowledge um, in academia and find find words to express uh, my identity and find words for experiences I had. Um, the, so it is great, but also um, we neglected um, at East an Eastern perspective on anti-racism, which is um, which is actually sad and um, also a loss. I wished um, there would be a, a there would be no more knowledge, and we could consider anti-racism um, inter more international and more intersectional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you see my face. So you know what that means. It's about that time. Oh, Katerina, thank you so much for sharing your research with us today and for leaving us with so much to think about. And Elizabeth for so masterfully leading the discussion. As always, we're grateful to Davidson College and Rutgers University Camden for making these invaluable conversations possible and to you in the audience for joining us. Today's recording will soon be available on our YouTube channel at Black Germans. Please subscribe and turn on the notifications so that you'll be alerted as new videos are added. Visit our website at bghra.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Eventbrite for details about future events and the annual conference in February. We hope that you've enjoyed our conversation as much as we have. And until next time, we thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much.